A battle for Libya's oil. The government in Tripoli accuses the United Arab Emirates of ordering warlord Khalifa Haftar to block petroleum exports. But what's behind the dispute? And could it scuttle attempts to end Libya's civil war? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. Oil has played a major role in the years-long conflict in Libya. Most of the oil fields are in the east under warlord Khalifa Haftar's control. This means the UN-recognized government of national accord in Tripoli has been cut off from a huge source of income. On Friday, Haftar's forces allowed a tanker to transport some of the crude for the first time in six months. But they reimposed a blockade a day later. Libya's National Oil Corporation blamed Haftar's backer, the United Arab Emirates, for ordering the move. The UAE says although oil production should resume, it wants what it calls safeguards in place to ensure revenues aren't used to fuel the conflict. Mahmoud Abdul Wahed has more from Tripoli. No sooner had the National Oil Corporation announced lifting the force majeure on the oil crescent area than Haftar's spokesman announced continuation of the oil blockade, uh, setting a number of conditions as a prerequisite to reopen the oil uh, crescent area. The conditions include opening a new account in a third country to receive the oil revenues and to guarantee equitable distribution of the oil revenues on all Libyans. And he also demanded that the accounts at the Central Bank of Libya must be reviewed to find out where the oil revenues uh, were spent over the past years. Now, the government of national accord officials say that those conditions are incapacitating. And uh, instead, they say that they cannot proceed in any negotiations with Haftar unless and until the oil crescent area, oil installations, oil terminals, and oil fields are reopened. For the first time, the National Oil Corporation has named the United Arab Emirates, accusing it of giving orders to Haftar to continue the blockade on the oil installations. The blockade on the oil uh, installations in Libya has raised a wave of criticism from international organizations, including the U.S. Embassy in Libya, which says that those who are undermining Libya's economy and clinging to military escalation will face isolation and risk of sanctions. Mahmoud Abdul Wahid for Inside the Story, Tripoli. Let's bring in our guests in London, Juma Al Gamati, a special envoy appointed by Libya's Government of National Accord. In Vienna, Wolfgang Pushtai, Austria's former defense attache to Libya, and in Washington, D.C., Jonathan Weiner, a former U.S. special envoy to Libya. A warm welcome to you all. I'd like to begin in London with you, uh, Juma Al Gamati. Um, for the first time, the National Oil Ministry has blamed the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, for this blockade. They say they gave uh, orders directly to Khalifa Haftar. What do you think? Is that true? Absolutely. And I think the uh, statement by the American uh, embassy uh, uh, to Libya or the American ambassador to Libya based in Tunisia alluded to uh, the same uh, idea. Uh, we have known all along, probably since 2014, since uh, Haftar appeared on the scene, that uh, he was merely a proxy for few countries, but the main one is the UAE, and that Abu Dhabi was controlling Haftar and directing him and giving him all the uh, support that he needed to pursue his military campaign to take over power by force in Libya and install a military regime. So this is no new. Uh, this is not new. And uh, and the fact is that uh, over the last few months, Haftar has been defeated and, and he has uh, withdrawn all the way. He has been forced to withdraw all the way from Tripoli some 500 kilometers east of Tripoli to, to Sirte and, and, and Jofra. His, his military campaign 
has has faltered. His his goal of taking over power in Libya has failed, which means that the Emiratis have failed, the Egyptians have failed, and the Russians and the and the French and possibly the Saudis as well have failed. So now the Emiratis are trying to salvage whatever they can politically in Libya by using the oil card as a leverage. And through controlling Haftar, they can actually manipulate this 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 leverage, this oil leverage, and and insist that Haftar should get something out of any political process or any political negotiation that is that is uh, forthcoming. So yes, there is no doubt that uh, the Emiratis are fully behind this, behind this blockade, and behind not lifting the blockade, and they have renegated on an agreement we believe that has been uh, tentatively reached uh, between few countries, including uh, America and including also the, the UN uh, mission uh, and, and Libya. So this is, this is a uh, a, a setback, uh, and a setback which means that the suffering of the Libyan people who rely wholly on, 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 on entirely on oil revenues uh, will suffer even more. Libya relies 98% or 99% of, in of income comes from oil, and uh, oil revenues are used to pay salaries, to pay subsidies, to pay for medicine, to face this uh, corona uh, uh, pandemic. And, and now uh, the fact that the, 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 there will be no lifting of this blockade, that means there will be no revenue, new revenue coming in. And that but Jemma, you've just said it yourself. Jemma, you've just said it yourself. You've said that uh, Haftar has been defeated, that he's had to move down to uh, 500 kilometers away from Tripoli, but he hasn't, has he? The oil blockade is perhaps a bigger weapon when it comes to strangling uh, Libya itself. And actually, Haftar and the UAE, his backers, the French, the British as well, uh, all of those people may be looking at the oil blockade as their next battlefield. Well, yes, now, because they, they, they lost the, the, the military card, they want to use the, the economic card. They, they want to use the oil leverage. Uh, but but that, that cannot be tolerated. It will not be accepted. The GNA has every right, with the support of Turkey, uh, to, to pursue uh, its goal of imposing its sovereignty on the entire Libyan uh, uh, land and also on the economic installations. Uh, the GNA is the recognized government. The NOC is the sovereign institution. Uh, empowered to run the oil industry in Libya, and uh, the, the NOC coordinates with the GNA. So we don't have to accept this, and, and we have to we have to carry on. We, we have to go on. If we are first, if we are forced to to go back to the to the military option and 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 resume fighting to liberate Sirte, Jofra, and and push after away from the oil crescent and, and other oil fields in the southwest, then let be it. But we cannot just give in and allow the Emiratis and other countries to manipulate us and, and to starve us of our uh, natural resources and of vital income for the Libyan population. Let's bring in Wolfgang in Vienna here. You were the former defense attaché to Libya. You'll have spoken to many of the key characters here. Is the nature because of the defeat of Khalifa Haftar and him pushing back. Is the nature of the conflict in Libya changing? Will it now be centered around the oil blockade, do you think? Well, at first, I need to stress that the importance, the significance of Khalifa Haftar is, from my point, quite exaggerated. This is not only about Khalifa Haftar. This is also about the grievances in the East. Have the, the Eastern grievances are not here because Hefta told them that they need to stand up. The Eastern grievances, the problems are for real. With regard to the Emirates' support, the Emirates' support is for, uh, actually much more important than the Russian support. The Emirates and the Egyptians are key for the survival of the LNA, so they are much more significant, have much more significance than Russia. But let me come to what you discussed about the oil revenues. The perceived unequal distribution of oil revenues in the East is one of the key grievances, not only in the East, but also in the South. There is evidence also in UN uh, reports that hundreds of millions, probably even billions, are lost to corruption, blackmailing and organized crime. Eastern tribal leaders claim that their sons are being killed with the money from their oil. Okay, that's their claim. Regardless of how true all this is, it must be taken into account. It's all about uh, perceptions. And as you know, there was a proposal by the United Nations, actually a demand for an international audit of the Central Bank of Libya. And there is the proposal for an escrow account on a foreign bank. And this could help to build up trust. 
The GNA and the CBL are against this, understandably from their point of view, because probably they are worried about the outcome of an audit. And if they don't have direct and full access to the revenues, this would actually undermine their position nationally and internationally. And of course, all the militias, criminal groups and Islamists who benefited from the revenues are also firmly against it. But let me highlight, this would be also a great opportunity to shed light on how much money was really transferred to the East and where it ended up. You know about the allegations about corruption in Haifa's family. And if everyone worked correct, there is no need to be scared of such an audit. Well, let's bring in Jonathan Weiner in uh, Washington, D.C. You were the special envoy uh, to Libya. What's the current U.S. thinking on Libya? Uh, the U.S. does not want Libya to be overrun by war, by war, instability, economic collapse, humanitarian disaster. The United States has made clear to all actors it wants to see things worked out politically and diplomatically, not by use of force. Uh, the uh, blackmailing of the government uh, the efforts to extort oil uh, as a weapon is um, impairing the country's ability to move ahead. No one should be shutting down Libya's oil. Uh, Libya's oil is used to take care of people throughout Libya, including in the east and the south. And uh, any time anyone has engaged in oil extortion, it's gone badly for the country. Now, do there need to be negotiations that are inclusive and that bring people together and uh, provide solutions for the country? There absolutely do. Does there need to be a uh, breakdown and shutdown of oil, oil uh, ahead of that? Well, if every Libyan is going to suffer as a result of that, um, I guess maybe you could make that argument. But what's happened, of course, is that the East has been funded in substantial part by counterfeit dinars backed by nothing, billions of them, tens of billions of them produced by Russia. It's also been backed by massive forced loans from banks in the East. So there's been bad economic behavior by absolutely everybody at home. The corruption does need to be cleaned up. There needs to be a transparency and accountability. But there also needs to be an end to negotiation at the point of a gun or through an efforts to undertake a blockade. Uh, no foreigner has the right to any of Libya's oil um, without paying for it and paying for it under contract. And um, no foreigner should be telling Libyans uh, what to do with their oil. Libyans need to work that out. But blockades are uh, a weapon being used by Libyan against Libyan that's not good for the country. But Jonathan Weiner, this administration seems to be reticent to get involved directly within Libyan politics. In fact, you actually have troops on the ground, although it has had them in the past. Um, where do you think the U.S., what do you think the U.S.'s role should be? Well, the U.S. should be encouraging all the foreign actors to pull their military uh, personnel and their weapons out of the country, pull all the mercenaries out of the country, uh, stop the risk of a broad proxy war uh, getting even bigger in Libya, and essentially push Libyans to negotiate with one another. That should be the U.S. policy. I think that is the U.S. policy. Uh, what's the difference between what we're doing now and what we did under the Obama administration in that regard? The Obama administration, we had tremendous engagement by the president by Vice President Biden, by Secretary of State John Kerry, by National Security Advisor Susan Rice, uh, as well as a lot of other people, including me. And in the Trump administration, uh, the, um, the ambassador has pretty much, most of the time, been left to defend for himself without a lot of ongoing support at a higher level. I'd like to see that change. I don't think it's going to change during the remaining months of the Trump administration. Jamal Gamati in London, should everybody pull out of Libya and leave, the, leave Libya alone? Is that the, the right way forward? Well, well, obviously, the biggest problem that we've had in Libya over the last six months is the regional and international interference. There's no, but, there's no doubt that um, uh, those countries who have been interfering in a negative way, uh, detrimentally fueling conflict and, and pouring oil over fire, have actually fueled the instability and not allowed Libyans to, to settle down and reach an accord, reach national reconciliation, and get on with the job of, of 
of, of, of a new political era and, and institutional state building. But let me just go back, please, and correct Wolfgang on three key points. Uh, I, I think we, we, we have to, because otherwise the, 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 the people will get the, the wrong idea. First of all, the idea of an international audit of the central bank, uh, he can check with Ansmel, because this is an idea suggested by Ansmel and Ghassan Salama. It was actually the parallel central bank in the East, headed by Ali Hebri, who refused this international audit, whereas the central bank in, in Tripoli have welcomed it. And until now, it's Ali Hebri and the parallel central bank in the East who is vetoing this and refusing any international audit to come and audit the accounts of the central bank, whereas in Tripoli or in the East. That's number one. Number two, the when he talks about grievances of the East and lack of, of fair distribution of uh, uh, oil revenue to the East and the South, let me remind him, and this is this is well proven in, 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 in statistics by, by the finance ministry, 60% of oil revenue go to salaries. And we have the highest percentage of people receiving salaries from the state probably in the world, over 30% of the population. Those salaries go to Libyans all over Libya, in the East, South, and West. And then on top of that, 10% goes as subsidies to food and fuel. And that subsidy also goes to the East, South, and West. So that's 70% of our revenue is distributed throughout Libya for all Libyan citizens. When it comes to corruption, uh, what about corruption in the East? What about the 40 billion dinars which the, the, the parallel government in the East borrowed from commercial banks and which the central bank in Tripoli will have to uh, actually meet one day and pay because these banks are, are guaranteed by the central bank? What about the 12 billion Libyan dinar that have been printed in Russia? and have been used only in the East. What about money stolen by Haftar's sons in hundreds of millions uh, in, the, in the East, and it's been taken to Venezuela um, uh, and used to buy gold, and gold was taken to Africa to exchange for another gold so that it cannot be traced, and that gold is probably placed in Switzerland or, in my, or Dubai or somewhere else. These are, th these are not my words. These are the, the gold from Venezuela is an international investigation which some, some bodies in the UN US are already pursuing. Uh, the other things I talked about, they are well documented in the in the UN reports, the the actually sanctions committee reports, which is part of the UN. It's not my say; it's the international community saying that. So, what about all these corruptions? Corruption is 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 endemic, and it's in Libyan society. Well, Jibbal, let's actually bring in, in Wolfgang. Let's actually society. bring in Wolfgang so now. Talk, he's been patiently about, listening. Jima, he has been patiently listening is, to you. Totally let's bring him in right now. Unfair. Let's bring him in right now to respond to some of those allegations. Uh, what do you think? Do you think um, Jamal Gamati has a point or is he exaggerating? Well, actually, what I've said is that this was an unsmill idea. The audit was an unsmill idea. This is exactly what I've said. And right now, the audit office in Tripoli is one of the blockers. And as Guma knows very well, the establishment within the CBL and within the Libyan Foreign Bank is also against this audit for some good reasons from their point of view. My point is, if everything is correct, why not make this open? Why not start with the CBL? The East cannot block this because actually all the money, and other than the Russian money, Guma is perfectly right about this, ended up first in uh, the Central Bank of Libya. And corruption in the East, I have highlighted this, and I've said that this would be also an opportunity to find out how much money really ended up in the East, how much money ended up in different pockets, and what happened with the money from, the money, let's call it money, from Russia. This is exactly what I've said. So why not start about this right now? Well, before Jamal actually answers that, I want to ask you another question, Wolfgang. When it comes to Khalifa Haftar, some of his backers are now getting frustrated with him. There were reports in today's media uh, that the French particularly are wondering if they have actually backed the wrong horse here because he seems to be not a great military commander. He's been defeated and he's now... Uh, being backed by the UAE with this oil blockade. Is there a thinking now from people within Europe particularly that maybe Haftar was the wrong decision? Actually, uh, this is not about the person of Khalifa Haftar. This is about the French interests. The French interests in Libya are mainly focused on the South with regard to the South as a safe haven for various terrorist groups, ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb and various others, destabilizing key areas of French national interest in the Sahara region, Niger, Mali, and so on and so on. And as the Libyan National Army was the one who was able to fight against terrorism down in the south, 
and as some of the groups affiliated with the Libya, with the uh, government of national accord actually cooperated with some people down there in the south, you know about the names, and as uh, the Libyan National Army also fought the uh, elements of Islamists in the east who were uh, actually endangering the French national interests in the region. This is the reason. So the French are not after Khalifa Haftar. They are not supporting Khalifa Haftar as a person. They are supporting uh, the fight against terrorism, especially in the south. And let me be clear, the French were, as far as I understand, absolutely not happy, not happy that the LNA attacked Tripoli. This was certainly not only a military mistake, this was also very poorly uh, conducted. There is no doubt about it. And the question is certainly for these people, is Khalifa Haftar the right man to lead the Libyan National Army or to, to be the leader of the East? And this is what brings in the head of the House of Representatives, who uh, is now on a tour through Europe to explain his point of view. I think the future of Libya is not with Hefta or this and that individual person. The future of Libya is with a new way, with a new form of a federalist state. Uh, Jonathan Weiner in DC. America has a problem right now when it comes to a lot of foreign policy thinking, foreign policy operations, foreign policy diplomacy, in that a lot of countries are simply waiting until November to make any decision. Um, it seems to me that we've been talking to lots of different people and they've all said to us, well, let's see what happens in the elections in December, in November, before we make any decisions about how we negotiate with the US. That can't be good for US's foreign policy, right? It is not good for US foreign policy, but US foreign policy has been handled miserably in any number of areas by President Trump and the Trump administration. And we have seen a disappointing, discouraging and distressing US retreat in Afghanistan and Syria and Libya, a failure to um, maintain U.S. values and support of pro promoting stability and security uh, for people and justice and freedom. And what we've seen instead is an advance um, in the interests of the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin. I don't think that's an accident. I think that's part of the problem. Jamal Gamati, um, Vladimir Putin is part of the problem. Uh, international actors generally are part of the problem. Now. The GNA, your government, you know, ha is backed by international uh, backers, but you're not... Why are you so far away from getting to an agreement with the South and with the East? It's not about the South and the East. That's, that's a misconception. We are quite happy to reach out and we are talking to a lot of people and the genuine people from the South and the East. When you talk about the East, you talk about social forces, political forces, civil, civil society forces, tribes. Uh, Haftar does not represent them. Haftar does not even belong to the East. He, he's, he's actually, he originates from the West. But those forces in the East are not, are being oppressed by Haftar for the last six years in a similar manner that Gaddafi has oppressed the East and the West and the South for 42 years. They cannot speak. They cannot criticize. They cannot have open contacts with the JNA. They will be uh, kidnapped. They will be imprisoned. They will be killed. Do you remember the member of parliament, Siam Sergiwa, the woman member of parliament? Ask Wolf, ask Wolf, Wolf, Wolf what happened to her. She's been kidnapped by by Haftar's militias and possibly killed just because she, she voiced her uh, a different opinion from within Benghazi and she is a member of parliament from Benghazi. So, uh, yes, we have no problem. We are willing. We are ready. We want to sit down and have a genuine dialogue with the real genuine forces of the East, whether they are social, political, civil, whatever it is, but not Haftar. He does not represent them. He represents the Emiratis, the French, as Wolf has said, and, the, and, and he's a proxy and he represents and the, the, the Russians and the Egyptians. So he, he, he does not represent the interest of the Libyan people, whether they are in the East, the South, and the West. That's one point. The other point, I'm afraid I have to correct Wolf again. He's presenting Haftar as the one who's fighting terrorism and as if the GNA is sympathizing with terrorism. That's a misconception. Wolf, remember, who let Daesh members gave them a safe route to, to come out of Benghazi and Derna and go all the way to Sirte in early 2016? It was Haftar. And whose forces demolished and uprooted Daesh or, or ISIS from the biggest presence outside Syria and Iraq, the Emirate of Sirte. 
It was the GNA. It was the Punyanur Marsus. Over six months, more than 3,000 Daesh members have been killed in Sirte, in the Emirate of Sirte. And the GNA and Punyanur Marsus forces sacrificed 742 lives to achieve that job. That was the biggest achievement against terrorism and against Daesh outside in Syria and Iraq. The Americans will testify to that because, because Africa was, was part of that operation by providing air support. So this is the reality of who's fighting terrorism. Haftar is not about fighting terrorism. It's not about building a, a, a civic state or a constitutional state. Haftar is about going back to the days of one man, military dictatorship rule. This is the crux of the matter of why the Emiratis are insisting on either controlling Libya or making sure that it remains in chaos for as long as possible. I would like to say that I think Wolfgang's point was actually about the French strategy of using people like Haftar for their own interests rather than simply fighting terrorism within Libya itself. Sadly, um, we would like to get into more of, of this. It looks like the oil blockade is going to be a talking point for a while to come. I want to thank all our guests, Juma al Gamati. Wolfgang Pustai and Jonathan Weiner. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.